um, talking about all the many data that you can get from the Copernicus C3S climate data store. Um, I will go a bit into what is it and why do we have it and how can you use them, um, how can you choose between them maybe. No uh, fixed recipes but some hints and information. I'll start off with a bit of a recap of what was said on Monday mostly by our chest from I'll recap. I will introduce you to the so-called matrix, the three-dimensional global model, regional model, emission scenario matrix, which we are populating and from where you will be able to get uh, climate simulation data. Um, I will go a bit into the why, where there are both uh, arguments about spatial patterns and there are arguments about temporal things like, for instance, extremes where you need a high temporal resolution, which will all um, give you a reason to choose regional climate model data for whatever applications you want to use um, rather than directly use global model data. I'll go a bit further into some details about where is the GCM really important, where is the RCM really important, how could you go about choosing models if you can't use all of them? Um, yes, this short introduction is from um, Eric Shellstrom's presentation. What we are doing is we are trying to describe all these different phenomena. You can see phenomena you can see sketched here in a numerical model in the sense that we take the equations that describe how things will change if we know the state of the atmosphere and then we just progress one time step at a time until we have more than 100 years of simulation. So what we do, as some of you may have seen on Monday, is that we split up Earth, atmosphere, into grid boxes and into levels. And then we have one value of each field where we're interested uh, in each box. And from that state, we will calculate how they change. A lot of these things depend on uh, phenomena take, processes taking place at sub grid scale um, uh, processes and um, therefore we need what's called parameterization. We need to have some equations that try to give us sub grid scale processes but only described by the um, so called prognostic fields which you know in the grid box. So the difference between weather forecasting and climate simulations was also from Eric. Um, it's basically the same kind of model we're using, but we are asking very different questions of the models. In weather forecasting, you want to predict the state some days into the future, and therefore the very most important thing is to know the initial state of the atmosphere. And then at, after some days, you lose predictability and you can't make weather forecasts. When you do climate simulations, we really don't want the initial state to have any influence. We want to look at statistics of very long uh, simulations, weather statistics, not when, but how much. And um, obviously, when we make much longer runs, we can only do it with a cause of resolution than the weather forecast. That was the brief recapitulation of what, uh, what it is all about, the, the field we are playing at. So what is it we can get? What is in the climate data store, which um, 
um, regional climate model data can you get? So most of these data come from the so-called Eurocortex collaboration. This is part of Cortex, which is an organization under WCFP, the World Climate Research Program, and the aim is to advance and coordinate science and application of regional climate downscaling. So this means that um, there have been experimental protocols, that is, which domains should, should we simulate, um, where are the corners of the domain, what is the resolution, which variables should we output, and in which temporal resolution should we do it, how um, can people access these data, and what is the data format, all that has been coordinated to make it easier for the end users to get hold of a lot of climate data. So I, we call them directly intercomparable. They are from different models, different global models, different emission scenarios, different regional uh, models, but they are more or less, or pretty closely, uh, over the same domains. And specifically, the Eurocortex um, domain is in relatively high resolution compared to other continents and other domains inside Cortex. Um, these simulations have been performed in 12 kilometer uh, resolution, that is, the average distance between grid points is around 12 kilometers. And um, we have quite a lot of these simulations that and normally start in 1951, some start in 1971, driven by global models, and go on all the way to, to, to 2100. There are, there are many, many sources of financing uh, this immense uh, effort, but um, I should mention that our hosts here, the, the Copernicus, um, program has financed roughly half of the simulations that you're able to get from the climate data store through this project CCS 34E lot 2, also known as principles, coordinated by Eric Schuster and ending in a couple of months. So when you go into the climate data store um, documentation, there is a link down here. You can find this matrix, which shows um, global models in one direction and regional models in the other. And you can see that many, many of these possible combinations of GC and potassiums, they have been populated. I have this matrix, which is basically the same, um, of the same data. There have been a few updates you may be able to see now. We saw a bit more green coming on the screen, which will be probably be there shortly. Orange means that the simulations are not quite finished yet, but they will be when uh, uh, the principles project ends. <coughs> Blue means there are more than one. That, that is, there are more than one uh, ensemble member of the GCM which has been downscaled by the corresponding region. The climate model. So when you go, go down here to the right, you'll see that we expect very soon to have 132 different uh, climate, regional climate simulations at 12 kilometer resolution um, with this set of RCMs and GCMs. And by chance, exactly half the simulations have been performed within the principle. Uh, just a few words about how large a data set we're actually talking about. There are roughly 400 by 400 points in 12 kilometers resolution covering this Europe plus a bit of the Atlantic plus the Mediterranean area. <laughs> Most models have roughly five minutes, minute time steps. I mean, that varies by a factor, but something of that order. And they have been all running for 150 years. 
this is a big thing that takes a while on a big supercomputer. And the result is about um, two terabytes of processed output per simulation. And of that, you will find um, these numbers of different fields, temperature, precipitation, wind, et cetera, et cetera, with different um, temporal uh, frequencies, which you can directly go and get from the CDS. And each annual field is roughly 100 uh, megabytes. So that's a lot of data if you really want to study. So why do we do it? What do we gain? First, some words about space, spatial resolution. This is just a slide that Eric gave to me. And what you can see is that when you go from GCM resolution to intermediately coarse RCM resolution and on to the 0.11 degree 12 kilometer resolution, which we have in the climate data store, you get something that is able to resolve most of a weather system spatially. Um, so when we look at regions and when we look at countries in Europe, it cannot be much closer than that. I will not talk about even higher resolution today, but there's a lot going on in even higher resolution, that means 12 kilometer things, where you will get even better descriptions of local things and It costs, well, every time you double the res resolution, you increase the cost at least eight times. Um, if we also want to do, oh, this is, sorry. If we look at the Alps, you can see this map is Po Valley and the Alps here. Um, we can compare GCM, um, precipitation field with a um, 50 kilometer resolution field with a 12 kilometer resolution field, what you find in the climate data store. And if we compare to the high resolution observation-based data set in the bottom, you will see that most of the regional features, where does it rain a lot, where does it rain less, the structure of mountains and valleys in the Alpine region is looks pretty well simulated in 12 kilometers and not in GCM resolution and not as well, <coughs> actually not very well in 50 kilometer resolution. What is even better is that when you look at the center of things, um, you get even, even larger improvement when you increase the this is also the Alps, but this is uh, simulations driven by reality. On the boundary, you have uh, uh, reanalysis from TMWF, the older arrangement. And what you see here on the uh, graph is an intensity spectrum. What is the frequency of so and so much daily precipitation? And they all go down. The more intense precipitation you, you look for, them, the more rare is to get it. But if you look at the, um, the observation data set, the green curve here, you will see that the global resolution is not at all able to get the values that the observation data, data set gets. It becomes a lot better if you look at 50 kilometer simulations, and we are pretty close <coughs> when we um, look at the 12 kilometer. There's plenty of room for improvement. I should stress that. And there's a lot going on, as I've already mentioned, in the even higher resolution um, modeling. But, but, but it is useful for a lot of things. This is from a big overview paper about what the Eurocortex um, collection of models says about uh, climate change. And what you can see here is the mean annual maximum daily precipitation, how much 
that changes in the set from a present day period to the future. Um, and uh, you will see that also on large scale, you get more detail, but you also get actually larger values. Okay, GCMs and RCMs, how different are these things? So, as an example, I will look at the catchment of the Baltic Sea, that's everything within the, this yellow boundary. Here, each symbol is one simulation, which you saw in the matrix. So it's all the three different scenarios we're looking at. You have squares, triangles, and diamonds. You have uh, the big things. The three big things are ensemble averages. Um, what I want you to note is that you have some correlation between temperature change along the x-axis and precipitation change along the y-axis. This is for, for winter. But you do have a lot of variability for, within each emission scenario. They are very different, um, very different uh, degrees of warming of that area. If we look at a more noisy field, like the 10 meter wind speed, you will see a lot of spread and you won't even be able to um, get a clear signal. Does this quantity increase or decrease? This means that <coughs> you can never just choose one simulation because you may be off for some uh, relevant field. You should have a look for the fields that are relevant to you and try as far as possible to take several simulations into account so that you, as far as possible, cover the spread of those fields which are relevant for you. I will skip that one due to time. Um, there are techniques you can use to look at what is the exact uh, influence of the GCM and what is the exact influence of the RCM. This study takes part of the matrix I just showed you, that is the red part here. We have a full matrix, a sub-matrix of five different GCMs and four different RCMs where all combinations have been done, have been simulated. If we plot the warming for all these 20 simulations, at the first glance, they look pretty similar. But we want to look at the differences. So if we subtract the 20 model average change from each individual change, you can see, ah, there is some systematic list. For instance, HATGEM, the uh, British GCM, seems to have a larger warming than, for instance, the Norwegian Norie SM, and they have each their own characteristics. You can split that up and look at what is the average climate change of all 20 models, and what would you add when you um, choose one specific DCM, and further add when you choose a specific RCM, a kind of linear first approximation. There are cross terms, of course, but they are not that big compared to, to these ones. And, and here you can clearly see, for instance, that there is, when you look at temperature, you will get <coughs> um, a much larger role from GCM than from the RCM. That's not always the case. Through the field we are looking at here, the, um, the winter temperature, that, that is clear. And you can see where are they very different and where are, are they not so that was it um all the papers i mentioned that you find them here the two in the middle they are very big evaluations of the entire eurobotics ensemble and i recommend very much to that you look them up if you want to learn more about the exact characteristics of the Simulation on Thank you.